Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second colloquium of the semester. If you have taken a course in speech perception or language development, you must have heard at least this study, which was done back in 1971, showing that infants as young as one month can actually demonstrate categorical perception. And this area is interesting because it tells so much about our capabilities in terms of linguistic and cognitive development. So we're very glad to have an expert in infant speech perception. Today, Dr. Derek Houston from The Ohio State University. He is now an associate professor in the department otolaryngology, head and neck surgery. He also has adjunct positions in the Department of Speech and Hearing Science at OSU, and also a PhD program in speech language hearing sciences for the City University of New York. Um, he received his bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Oregon and his master's and PhD degrees from cognitive psychology from Johns Hopkins University. So the study I was mentioning to was done by um, a group of researchers including Peter Jusick and Dr. Houston actually worked with Peter Jusick as a PhD student. And after his PhD, he did a postdoc as an NIH postdoc research fellow at Indiana University School of Medicine. So you can tell by his background that this is a really very interdisciplinary area. We were talking about how nice it is to have uh, people from different areas to work together on the issues of speech and hearing and, and language, and I think you, you see that um, here in, in him as well. So when he was doing his PhD, his research focused on infant speech perception, um, in particular, segmentation from fluent speech and also uh, word recognition from different speakers. And when he went to Indiana, he started doing research on speech and language, speech perception and language skills of deaf infants who receive cochlear implants. Dr. Houston has numerous, numerous publications and um, I was reading his CV. I think he has probably won all the NIH grants that there are. Um, so his research is... <laughs> supported by um, two R01 grants from the National Institutes of Health right now. And um, I know last um, week we had a conversation about clinical implications, clinical relevance of basic science research. Uh, I think that you are going to see that clinical relevance is important, clinical implications are important, but they will not happen without solid science. Okay, so uh, my last remark is that uh, this is not his first time in Athens, but he is looking for good camping sites around this area. So if you have any advice, I'm sure he will be happy to talk to you. Dr. Houston. Thank you. I think that's like the best introduction uh, uh, I've ever heard. For Thank you. It's like, uh, I'll send you a bill. Yeah, please do. Uh, maybe we can tour together now. Um, uh, and I'm very happy to be here. I've heard great things about this program. Of course, the the, uh, the, the productivity of the uh, uh, and the and the excellence of the work of the faculty members of this department is just is just outstanding. And and uh, it's a really great program. Laura Stevens, who's a new colleague of mine, graduated from this program a couple of years ago, and. Uh, uh, and talks about it often. Um, and uh, as Dr. Lee mentioned, I moved here from um, Indiana. Uh, and I've only been in Ohio for a little bit over a year. Uh, and I'm really enjoying it and enjoying being able to see, uh, you know, different parts of Ohio. Uh, so it's great to be in Athens um, and to be at this Grover, is it Grover Center? Right. Yeah, it, it was a little bit intimidating walking in. Um, there's those like gravestones on on the pathway. No, they're, they're the names way. of previous presidents oh, okay. of the university. Was, yeah. But a lot of them are in graves. Yeah. It's a little bit. I was a little bit worried about. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seems a little ominous or something. Um, That's a one million dollar design. One million dollar design. Yeah. Okay. Well, that you know, it's uh, it's uh, and and to you know coming from Indianapolis to be in a place that has some hills is uh, really nice too. 
Columbus is the same light, right? Um, so anyway, um, so just to kind of get us all on the same page, uh, what we know about cochlear implantation in, in children with hearing loss. Um, cochlear implants, of course, provide <coughs> access to sound to individuals with severe to profound hearing loss. Um, but kind of one of the hallmarks of this field is the enormous amount of individual variability in outcomes. And, and it's kind of like, I don't know, the, 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 the reason d'etre of the, of the field, right? Like, is to figure out what, what is behind the, um, the variability in outcomes. Uh, because variability in outcomes means that some kids are not doing very well with their cochlear implants. They're ending up um, not being able to uh, achieve uh, age-appropriate language. So uh, in, in, in that way, you know, there's good variability and there's not good, you know, and there's bad variability. That's kind of the bad variability, right? We want, we want all kids to do, uh, to do well with language. Um, there are a number of uh, important, what I call demographic factors, that have uh, been identified um, that account for some of the variability in uh, language outcomes after cochlear implantation. Uh, the one that's uh, received a lot of attention um, and is probably <coughs> the most powerful predictor of, uh, of outcomes is the age at which a child gets a cochlear implant. Um, but there is, um, but you know, we really, if you think about it, learning that early implantation leads to better language outcomes doesn't explain anything, right? I mean, that's just a fact. We, we can learn that, but it doesn't tell you why early implantation leads to better outcomes. Um, we sort of have a vague idea like, well, yeah, earlier is better, earlier in the language development process. But really, if we want to understand why early implantation leads to better outcomes, we want to know what are the underlying cognitive and linguistic mechanisms that are affected by early auditory experience, okay? And the way I address this question kind of from a, a larger perspective is to um, dig through the literature for all the studies I could find that looked at aged implantation effects um, on language outcomes uh, or any kind of outcomes in kids with cochlear implants and, and now focusing on what has been the focus for the last several years now is implantation under one year of age versus implantation after one year, so let's say one to two years of age. The reason one year is kind of the important uh, cutoff is because the, the FDA guidelines recommends uh, or approves cochlear implantation only down to 12 months of age in the U.S. So uh, whenever um, an infant under 12 months is given a cochlear implant, it's called off-label. Um, uh, so it, it still doesn't happen uh, very often. But there are, as you can see, uh, the column on the left, there are a number of studies that have shown that early implantation leads to better outcomes. And so from now on, when I say early implantation, I mean implantation under one year of age, okay? And later implantation as uh, between one and two years of age. Um, but there have, but you see there have been mixed results. So there are a number of studies that also have shown no differences in outcomes um, from early implantation. And for some of you who, probably those who are paying careful attention, close attention, you notice that some of these are the same studies on, on both sides. And uh, as you might guess, uh, that's because um, uh, a lot of these studies tested multiple outcomes. On some of the outcome measures, there were differences. On other uh, outcome measures, there were, no, there were no differences. So to make this easier to figure out, or to take a step toward figuring out, I uh, went through all the studies and listed, now on uh, left column, are all the measures in which a uh, difference was found. And on the right side, um, all the measures in which a difference was not found. Um, 
and actually surprising to me, uh, I have not found any measures where one group reported a difference and, and another group did not, um, which is like, it, it, dealing with infants is a degree of, of uh, replicability that I'm not used to. Um, <laughs> um, and, and what is especially interesting is, is about how these um, sort themselves out. So uh, there's one exception, okay, uh, uh, of these two groups. This, this one should be over there if, if it was a perfect world, but it's not. Okay, so all, all except this measure, measures of receptive, general measures of receptive and expressive uh, outcomes falls in the yes, earlier is better um, column. Vocabulary also. Uh, these are measures, I don't know if you know the it mays, like very basic measures of sort of auditory awareness. Um, auditory visual association, and measures of babbling and, and speech intelligibility, okay? What's really interesting are the measures that, that no one has found any differences. CNC and LNT, all of these, these top three are all basically word recognition tasks. So these are sort of the gold standard for what this field calls speech perception, right? Um, and, and some speech discrimination tasks, some of them coming from my lab. So uh, the really, uh, uh, you know, and as Dr. Lee said, I came from a, a speech perception background, infant speech perception background. So, you know, sort of to, to my surprise and dismay, um, er, there is no evidence so far that very early cochlear implantation leads to better speech perception, okay? And this is really surprising, especially because very early cochlear implantation leads to better receptive and expressive language outcomes, right? So from my background and perspective, this is really odd because, right, because how is the story supposed to go? Right? You get a cochlear implant at a very early age. This helps you hear better at an early age, which helps you perceive speech better and encode speech better at an early age. Allows you to learn words better and you know, develop grammar and all that. It should happen in this sort of bottom-up fashion. Then why do we find better uh, results at this level but not down here? What's going on? Well, one thing is that we've obviously not exhausted all the possible ways of measuring speech perception. There, should, there could be uh, uh, other more subtle ways of, of measuring speech perception that would detect differences. How, however, I will say that, I guess an argument against that is that um, these same measures did show differences in speech perception decades before when people were interested in whether cochlear implantation under three years of age, you know, provided better speech perception skills, uh, resulted in better speech perception skills than implantation after three years of age, or even before that, people were looking at under five versus uh, uh, after five. So earlier implantation does lead to better speech perception until you get to the really young age. At least that's what the findings show us. Um, so far, but when you get to the really young ages, it still results in better language outcomes. So um, one thing that we thought about is um, what else happens when a child gets a cochlear implant at a very young age, right? What um, what does that do to their experience, right? I mean, if you're a child who has severe to profound hearing loss, your experience with the world is mainly through the other senses, right? When you get the auditory sense, then you're integrating the auditory sense with everything else that, that you're experiencing. So even if the earlier auditory experience doesn't result in a more fine-grained auditory experience, it still gives the infant earlier access to that experience of integrating what they're hearing 
with what they're seeing and touching and, and, and everything else, right? So it's this integration of auditory and primarily <coughs> visual uh, experience that could be important for early development and early language outcomes. So if that's the case, well, what's sort of the most obvious language skill uh, that uh, has to do with associating what you hear and what you see? The most basic language skill. What do we do when we learn language? We learn words, right? And what is learning words mainly entail? You hear something and you figure out what 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 it's associated with uh, outside the world in the world. So we did a novel word learning experiment looking at uh, the effects of aged implantation. So this is what our this is a schematic of how we study. Uh, novel word learning in infants. Um, an infant sits on the caregiver's lap in front of a uh, TV. The TV is, uh, we put a facade in front of the TV so that the only thing that's exposed is the uh, screen and then a small hole for the camera. Um, and that's because when you, you work with infants, you learn very quickly that infants will pay attention to anything that you don't want them to pay attention to <laughs> if, they, if they have a chance. I mean, so, to, to, you know, so much so that like this, this, this chair would be a good chair to use, but this chair wouldn't, okay? Why is that? I learned the hard way one time when I helped set up a lab somewhere else is that like, I, uh, you know, I just picked some random chair for the, for the parent to sit in. And then like the first kid that we ran, like the, the baby spent the entire experiment playing with the arms of the chair. So, so now I know that like, okay, every chair I've used since then, it doesn't have arms. But, <laughs> and, and so like, yeah, we try to cut, we, we have curtains here so that really there's nothing to see except for the uh, screen. And the parent listens to masking music and background battle so that they're blind to the conditions of the experiment. Um, here's some uh, pictures. So this is, you can't really see very well, I'm sorry. I mean, because we used uh, black curtains. This is actually from the Indiana University lab. I, I, uh, uh, I switched to gray now, um, not just for the pictures, but because some kids, you know, they, you, you bring them into a really dark room, you know, with these black curtains that absorbs all the light. It's a little bit intimidating. Uh, anyway, and this little glowing orb right here is actually uh, a, a laughing, a video of a laughing baby that helps get their attention to, um, the, uh, to the center of the screen before we initiate each trial. It just doesn't show up in there very well. All right, so what, what we're doing is we're looking at, again, does earlier implantation lead to better word learning? Uh, and um, for this particular study, we actually narrowed our early and late groups um, a bit uh, compared to a lot of other studies where our late group uh, was actually implanted still very early, between 12 and, and 16 months of age. We really wanted to zero in on that critical uh, uh, 12 uh, month range because you see a lot of studies where um, they compare before 12 months and between one and two years. Well, if, if the kids who are uh, getting implants between 18 months and 24 months are carrying the effect, right, of, uh, of the later group, then that isn't really very good evidence that we should be providing implants under 12 months of age. Uh, anyway, that's a little bit of an aside. Um, now we published a, now this one I'm presenting is not published yet. Uh, we did publish an earlier version of this where we had more uh, uh, infants and they had a broader range of hearing loss. Uh, and we found that the amount of residual hearing correlated strongly with novel word learning. Um, so that's the, uh, so generally uh, all kids who get a cochlear implant have uh, somewhere in the severe to profound uh, hearing loss range. Some have actually down to sort of moderate, severe moderate range. Um, uh, and that actually makes a really big difference uh, when you look at outcomes. So uh, in order to really focus in on the effects of aging and implantation, we wanted to make sure that 
the amount of hearing at the beginning was um, at the same level. So they all had uh, uh, profound hearing loss. Um, and we tested them when they had one to one and a half years of uh, cochlear implant experience. And then we compared them to normal hearing chronological age match controls. Uh, we um, used a variant of the intermodal preferential looking paradigm and I'll show you what that looks like. It's fairly self-explanatory. There's the uh, baby that I told you about. <coughs> and this, these are just a couple or three sample trials. So we have two, here's a trial. Look here, trial. it's a blick. See the blick? That's the blick. Blick. Look what the blick is doing. Blick. There's the blick. They like they like these animals. Look here, uh, it's a modi. Keeps their See attention. See the modi? That's the modi. Okay. Modi. Look what the modi is doing. Modi. There's the modi. So here you go. You'll be tested on it now. <laughs> blick. See okay, the blick? Which one is it? Blick. There's the blick. So you see it, it bounces a little bit at the end. Um, we. Uh, uh, there's, we have a little bounce at the end in case they haven't learned it at the beginning, that they still have an opportunity to learn it. Of course, when we analyze the data, that last second of the reinforcement is not included. Um, <clears throat> forward. Oops. Look here. It I'm sure you want to hear that again. Right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so a little, a few details about the, the methodology. Uh, we start with two, what we call task familiarization phrase. So we have like a ball and an apple or, um, you know, two words that we think kids at this age are all going to know. So they just get used to the idea that they'll be hearing words that are associated with what they're seeing on um, the, the monitor. And then we have that training phase where uh, they get two trials of, of, for each of the two words, Blick and Modi. Um, and then the test phase contain, uh, consists of four blocks of four trials. And, and within uh, each block, they're asked to look at the Modi twice and at the Blick twice in sort of pseudo-random order. And then between each um, test phase, uh, they have another opportunity to learn the words where they just see a static image of Blick and they say Blick, that's the Blick, and then Modi, that's the Modi, okay? Okay, and here are our early and late groups. Uh, so we had 10 of each, um, and so you see their age of implantation in the range. Um, and then this is their aided uh, uh, PTA, so their unaided was, you know, well above uh, 90 decibels. Um, their communication mode uh, were fairly well balanced. That was just pure luck. Um, the uh, number of kids who had bilateral implants at time of testing, uh, two each, that was pure luck. Um, of course, we controlled when we tested them, so um, their hearing age at test, so how much experience they had with cochlear implant was uh, matched. Um, another thing that was pure luck was that um, the, uh, this is our, well, unfortunately, this is our only sort of socioeconomic status variable. Um, uh, maternal education levels were pretty similar, definitely far from being statistically significant. Okay, and here are the data. Okay, uh, so what you see here are their looking times average across all the trials to the target and to the non-target. So to Blick when they hear Blick, to Modi when they hear Modi, and then to the other one. So the early implanted kids uh, look significantly longer to the target than the non-target, demonstrating that they learn the association between the words and the objects. And the late implanted kids did not show um, a, a significant looking time difference. Okay, so um, so here's another quiz. What 
So, so can we conclude that uh, early implanted kids are better at novel word learning than late implanted kids? You can probably tell the way I'm asking that, that the answer is no, um, from, from just from these data at least. Um, and why not? Okay, so these two, the other than being implanted at different ages, what else <coughs> is different about these two groups of kids? The late implanted kids are not only implanted later, they're actually older, okay? Because, you know, you have to, you have to compromise something when you have aged implantation and you have uh, amount of uh, uh, experience with the cochlear implant. Uh, you can't have everything the same. So, um, because uh, the late implanted kids were implanted later, and then we gave them the same amount of experience with implants, they're also older. And whenever you're using uh, an infant or a toddler uh, paradigm. Uh, methodology you have to be you have to make sure that the methodology is appropriate for the age that you're testing um, so that's where the normal hearing age match controls uh, come in so here are the early implanted kids compared to their normal hearing age match controls and they look very similar um, and then here are the late implanted kids compared to their normal hearing so, and they look very different. So we, we can't uh, say that the methodology was not appropriate for uh, their age. Now, we shouldn't say that, I mean, of course, and late is in quotes, right? Late implanted. These are still kids implanted very early. They're learning words. It's not that they can't learn words. It's that within the context of this experiment where they had a limited number of exposures to the words and the objects, um, they were less able to uh, uh, learn the words than their early, earlier implanted counterparts or their normal hearing age match controls, um, um, which, you know, does suggest um, at least that uh, uh, that they might not be able to learn the associations as as easily um, so um, any questions at this point no okay um, so I want to go back to the beginning of the talk where um, the question was why uh, do we see better outcomes with early implantation in receptive and expressive language, but not better speech perception for, for very early implantation. And the idea was that it might be it might be word learning, might be one of the underlying skills that's affected by very early uh, experience. Um, so we do find, so this suggests that early access to sounds has, to sound, has an effect on uh, early word learning. Now, whether or not that early access to sound and subsequent better novel word learning is what accounts for the better outcomes, we need to look at the relationship between early word learning and later outcomes. So here we do correlations to um, see if performance on the novel word learning task predicts later outcomes. Um, so this, we took just all the kids and put them in one group. Um, and this actually includes all the kids we've ever tested in the study because this is a slightly different question, right? This is about the relationship between the task, the word learning task, and later outcomes. And so these are um, all the kids that we have early outcomes on, or sorry, that we got the word learning um, uh, task, we got them through the word learning task, and we're able to bring them back three to four years after implantation. So this would be two years after they were in the novel word learning task um, to uh, test their vocabulary, their receptive and expressive language, uh, and their speech perception. Okay, and what we found was uh, a correlation between um, novel word learning skills that they showed at 
you know, one year after implantation, and their um, vocabulary and receptive and expressive language um, two or three years later. No correlation with speech perception, interestingly. Well, maybe. I mean, you may have noticed that the two words blick and modi are very, very distinct. I mean, that was intentional. We wanted it to be a word learning experiment and not a speech perception experiment. Um, so um, it, didn't, it didn't, you know, challenge their, their speech perception skills. Um, this, uh, these correlations actually hold, not only hold up, but are actually strengthened um, by, uh, by doing partial correlations and controlling for uh, the factors that we know um, affect both word learning and um, these uh, outcome measures, uh, age and implantation and, and residual hearing. Uh, so this is pretty good indication that uh, early uh, access to sound uh, results in novel word learning, which in turn uh, helps with um, overall language development. Okay, so to conclude that part, um, again, it's a surprise to me, there's no evidence so far that implantation under one year leads to better speech perception uh, skills. Um, but it does lead to better novel word learning skills and probably other auditory integration skills. We have some other studies. Um, and of course, not surprisingly, uh, early word learning skills are important for language outcomes. Um, and this is just one study among a growing number of studies showing that Early auditory experience is important for things in addition to hearing and, and speech perception. Um, so uh, other people, some of my colleagues, um, uh, have found uh, that early experience is important for general auditory visual association tasks. For there's some studies going back to the 80s that. Uh, that uh, early auditory experience is important for um, uh, visual attention. Um, uh, uh, Unpublished studies still that we have um, is that early auditory experience is important for visual habituation, which actually is a very interesting finding, which I'm going to review here in a second. Um, and. Uh, for visual sequence learning, working memory, and, and even for uh, concept formation. Um, people are finding uh, that there are differences between kids who uh, have hearing loss and, and children with normal hearing. A lot of times, uh, language is, of course, a mediating factor here. Um, but uh, just to quickly review uh, this study, because this is, um, and this is something we're still working on, not collecting data, but doing continued analyses, is this uh, visual habituation study. Um, we recruited uh, 23 deaf infants. So these uh, were cochlear implant candidates, but we um, tested them before they had cochlear implants. So they're deaf babies. Um, and then compared them to uh, normal hearing age matched peers. And the task is a visual habituation task, which is like one of the most basic fundamental infant cognition tasks dating back to the early 1960s, if not before. Uh, in fact, um, uh, and, and the idea, visual habituation, is, is you want to look at the rate at which a child uh, an infant habituates to a visual stimulus. So, you know, habituate means reduce their looking time um, uh, to the visual stimulus. And rate of visual habituation uh, has been associated with visual processing. So the idea is that the, the faster infants are at processing visual information, so more efficiently processing visual information, the more quickly they'll get bored with it and show habituation. So the looking times will decrease at a faster rate. And this um, habituation um, uh, rate measure has correlated with um, nonverbal IQ uh, scores in, in a number of studies, um, especially there was a ton of work on this back in the 1970s. Um, so anyway, so we 
uh, we decided to do a visual habituation study um, with these kids and we basically presented them with one of our um, <laughs> I guess out of laziness we just took one of the objects we had from another experiment which happens to be the one that I just presented um, our, our word learning experiment and just presented to infants and basically they would see this image and this image stay on the uh, monitor until they looked away from it for one second or more or until a maximum of, I think, 20 seconds, all right? So basically what you'd see is they'd look longer the first trial and their looking times would decrease. Okay, and then here's just the other image, all right? And what we found was that um, uh, two findings. One, one is that the um, normal hearing infants habituated in significantly reached habituation criterion, oh, which I didn't tell you what that was, okay? So um, they reached habituation criterion when their mean looking time over three trials is 50% or less than their mean looking time during the first three trials. So. Right? So if they look for 10 seconds on average for three trials, we'd keep on presenting the image, uh, image until their looking time average over three trials, three consecutive trials, was five seconds or less. And to reach that criterion for the normal hearing infants took an average of, of um, what was it, seven trials, and or six and a half or seven, and then it was about eight and a half for uh, the deaf infants. Um, and to look at this in more detail, uh, we looked at the looking time um, of the first four trials. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, measuring number of habituation trials can be a little bit tricky because sometimes um, infants, and this is just kind of a bug in the, in the methodology, that we just live with um, is that like if a if an infant is very interested in uh, a, a stimulus, they might look at it for a really long time at the beginning, and then that could um, that makes reaching habituation easier, right? In a way, because then then the then the habituation criterion. Say they look 20 seconds on the first three trials, then they only have to get down to 10 seconds. To, to be able to reach criterion. Whereas uh, sometimes you'll even see the first couple trials, I mean, because we're dealing with babies, right? And so they just like to turn around and like look at mom right away. So then like the first three trials could be like two seconds each, and then, you know, it could take them forever to reach uh, habituation. So that's, that's uh, to me, that's not the greatest measure. I don't know. There's like a ghost over here in <laughs> my slides. Um, anyway. Um, uh, so, all, so all babies received, no matter how quickly they, they habituated, uh, received at least four trials. So we looked at those first four trials and we saw that the, um, that the two groups actually were pretty similar on the first trial, which I think is important, um, but you see the, actually the rate of uh, decreasing looking time for the hearing infants is steeper than the rate of decrease for um, the deaf infants, uh, which is is I mean we had we honestly we had no reason to um, to expect <laughs> uh, this, um, but it it and really it leads to more questions than answers. I, I mean I the classic way of Interpreting those results would be to say that the deaf infants were slower at visual processing than the hearing infants. Um, but of course, you know, there's a, a, another possibility is that um, that the deaf infants could be more interested in the visual uh, stimulus because they're deaf. Now, the fact that the, there was no difference in looking time for the first trial. Um, is not consistent with that interpretation, but still, um, 
uh, and, and how we want to look at this is that we're now doing more fine grain um, analysis of what they're looking or actually the the number of saccades um, during each trial to see if the deaf infants are scanning the objects more uh, which may indicate that they're you know visually exploring the objects uh, more and maybe that's why uh, they don't habituate more um, quickly they might be basically processing more information from from the visual objects than the normal hearing um, children okay so so what these results and and others tell us and this is a a, a quote from uh, a, a a leader in the field of, uh, of uh, deaf um, education and and cognition, Mark Marshark, uh, he, he says, you know, deaf children are not hearing children who can't hear. And I think that's a pretty profound uh, uh, statement, really. It's very, it's simple, but profound. Uh, you, we can't, we shouldn't think of deaf children as being, you know, the lacking hearing, purely lacking hearing. They're developing in a fundamentally different way, and so we need to understand uh, their development. Um, they're, they're, they're not simply lacking hearing. Um, and, um, and, and, and really, uh, I think, um, uh, well, I don't know, only the psychologist maybe will understand like the sort of like uh, Fodorian modularity uh, 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 thinking, you know, of like the 90, 80s and 90s and even 1970s where, where uh, cognitive scientists used to, you know, really think about um, mental processes as being encapsulated into distinct areas and now, you know, increased understanding of, of how the, the brain is wired and, and mental functions are wired, um, that, you know, everything is is basically interconnected um, that uh, it, it, it would be uh, it would be really a surprise if any kind of um, sensory difference early on um, w ended up being restricted to just that domain for the whole life right Th throughout development I mean our sensory experience is how we develop our sensory motor experience. This is kind of going back to Piaget, constructivism. Um, and then I like to, a related quote from my colleague, David Pizzoni, who likes to say, the ear is connected to the brain, which is the title of the talk, right? Um, now, how much time, how are we doing on time? Um, we have, 15 minutes until the end of the talk, so you should probably give the audience a few minutes yeah. before that, so you probably have five minutes. Okay, all right, so I will, that's perfect. So how these findings have changed my, um, I guess, thinking and direction in research is that, uh, is at first it's, it's really become obvious that that word learning is important, and that um, in the, if we could get kids to be really good word learners, uh, if we could just do that, it wouldn't be a magic bullet or a silver bullet or whatever, but it, it definitely would be uh, a step in the right direction in terms of uh, therapy. And um, when I've asked and the first many times that I talked about this work and asked clinicians about word learning, you know, there really isn't very much research about how to develop kids into good word learners. And there are techniques, right, that you, a lot of you are probably familiar with, with, with teaching vocabulary, but there aren't really techniques for teaching how to be good at learning vocabulary. Right, at least none that, that I've heard of, um, and uh, uh, and in fact there aren't really I, I've learned very many studies even comparing different techniques of, of teaching vocabulary. Um, so 
it's really like okay if if we want to um, uh, you know decrease the amount of variability in outcomes you know in other words get more kids able to be at age appropriate language um, um, a good place to aim is at uh, helping with word learning well how do we get them to be better word learning um, word learners okay and one thing that uh, is, uh, is is you know obvious but wasn't obvious to me until I don't know when but like okay in input matters what the kids hear at home what they experience at home matters for uh, um, for development in general and it seems and there's growing evidence that it's important for vocabulary development so there's a really great study um, a couple years back by Weisleder and, and Ann Fernald where they uh, recorded speech of infants in the homes and then um, uh, and then so they used this thing called a Lena device and it recorded the speech in the homes and then they got a word count of like how many how much input the child got at home and then they tested the vocabulary and they found uh, not surprisingly that the amount of speech to the child um, correlated with vocabulary level. Uh, actually, the surprising result was, was, though, the amount of speech overall in the child's uh, environment did not correlate at all with vocabulary. So the, 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 the take home from that is like, you know, having your baby, you know, over there while you're having a conversation really doesn't do much good. Um, and uh, another interesting aspect of this result is that uh, they found, uh, or they posited a direct and an indirect route in which input to the child leads to very, uh, better vocabulary. The direct route is just, okay, you're talking more to the kid, they have uh, more opportunity to learn words, so they'll learn more words. The indirect route is that um, talking more to uh, uh, children allows them to process speech more efficiently and by being able to process speech more efficiently, they can learn words better. So it's kind of like double bonus, right? You talk more to kids, you give them more opportunity to hear words, and they become better at being able to process that information. And they, they, they found that by also bringing the kids in for a task in which it's called their looking while listening task. Um, so very similar to the word learning task I showed you, uh, except they are all known words, and they just measure the response time to look at the correct word. So yeah, if there's like apple and keys or whatever, um, uh, how quickly the child responds to the word correlated with the vocabulary and, co and accounted for some of this relationship between input and vocabulary. So, we're, so one of the projects um, I'm leading right now is to look at uh, basically replicate that study with kids with cochlear implants. So here's the little, there's like a little Lena device here. It's about the size of a deck of cards, fits in a pocket, and then um, it records up to 16 hours of speech in the child's uh, environment. And then in, uh, the software will automatically give you um, all kinds of, uh, you know, this is number of words per hour. Um, and then we're actually going to dig into the actual speech itself and determine how much of that speech uh, was directed to the child versus directed to other people and measure acoustic properties of the speech to be able to assess not only the quantity of speech that they get in the home, but also the qualities of the, spit, of the speech, like how, you know, motherese or parentese it is or, or you know, things like that. Um, the other sort of obvious thing um, is that interaction matters. Uh, so when you're talking to a child, you're usually interacting with them too, and this is important. So we've launched a research project in collaboration with colleagues down in, uh, we, I started when I was in Indiana with colleagues down in Bloomington, and they are computer scientists and cognitive scientists who've um, uh, developed this really nifty 
methodology that we like to call the, the, the PIE study for parent-infant eye tracking. But it's more than just eye tracking. So you see mom and, uh, and, and child both geared up. Uh, they have uh, head-mounted cameras. So we can see what they're looking at from their own perspective. And they also have eye trackers so that we not only see what they're seeing, their, their field of vision, but exactly what they're looking at within that field. They're dressed in all white, which you might have noticed. Um, and, and the uh, purpose of that is because uh, our colleagues developed automatic object recognition um, software, um, which having everything except the colored objects in white helps with that process. And the reason um, uh, that methodology uh, is used is so that we can track in time, moment by moment, where the objects are and their relative visual saliency of the child, right? So one of the major discoveries of, of our colleagues down in Bloomington is that babies have short arms. Um, <laughs> this is very important for word learning because like, you know, if, if I'm holding this, it's like, it's like there and, and it's only this much of my, of my visual field. If I'm a baby holding this, it's like occupying way more of my visual field and much more salient. So, uh, we, so we can capture the relative salience of, of each object. We transcribe what the parent is saying. We also code what the child and the parent are holding moment by moment. And then we, and then, so all of those aspects are not really the, 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 the really cutting edge part of our colleagues in Bloomington. The, the cutting edge part is their ability to, um, uh, is, is developing scripts to be able to do analyses of this huge amount of rich data that we acquire from um, parent-child interactions. So what we do, you see the three objects, we just say, okay, uh, mom or dad, this, this thing is called a ZB, this is a Wawa, this is something else. Um, if you're going to talk about this object, please use those labels. We don't even tell them explicitly to teach the names of the objects and just play as you would. And then we give them a little cheat sheet so they can remember the, the names of the objects. And then, so then they interact. And then after the, the interactions, we, and they get three objects at a time, six total. And then afterwards we test the kids and see which objects they learned the labels for and which ones they didn't learn um, the labels for. And then we can go back and see what were the interactions like for the objects they learned the labels for and what were the interactions like for the objects they didn't learn the labels for to get at what kinds of interactions are lead to more successful word learning. That's, that's the idea. And now we're still like analyzing our data, but uh, um, one preliminary finding is that, that's interesting, is that, um, um, because we've tested a, about a dozen parents who have children with hearing loss and then uh, normal hearing age match controls. And um, uh, in our preliminary analysis, what we found is that uh, when uh, a parent of a normal hearing child, every time they label a word, right? So we get each time they label a word, the chances are, so more than 50% chance, that child is holding that object that they're labeling, okay? Whereas for the parents of children with hearing loss, when they would label a word, more often than not, they themselves were holding the object. The parent was holding that object, which is, is um, very consistent with uh, research showing that parents of children with hearing loss um, are more directive uh, than um, uh, parents of uh, typically uh, developing kids, um, but that's just a that's just a first uh, 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 very preliminary finding of our studies. I mean, eventually, what we'll be able to do is see what kinds of interactions lead to better word learning. Um, 
and this is a a view from their from the infant's uh, camera and from the parent's camera. Um, here's I'll just play a couple seconds. Of, yeah, so you can see the crosshairs where where the eyes are looking. Yeah, that's a dodie. Right, and then and then what we really like to geek out on are are these uh, plots where we plot like you know we have the red, the green, and the blue objects, and then pink is for face, and then we see where the parent is looking and where the infant is looking. You know, at every frame. So we're talking thirty frames per second, and this is uh, so we had one dyad an infant with normal hearing and another an infant with uh, hearing loss. And this is very anecdotal, you know, this, these aren't group uh, st um, results. Um, but um, of these two kids, it just happens that um, the infant with normal hearing and their parent uh, were looking at the same objects. Like here are all the places where they're looking at the same objects, whereas the child with hearing loss, there were, there were many fewer times where they're looking at the same objects. Again, that's just a sort of example of the kinds of uh, things that we can look at. Um, so anyway, sorry, that was probably more than five more minutes, wasn't it? So uh, 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 here are the uh, agencies that fund our work, and here's our new lab with our new people. And yeah, thanks for uh, your time and listening. But we do have a few minutes for questions. Yes. First of all, thank you very much. I'm just blown away by that last part that you ended with uh, the possibility. Yeah, I knew I could. Thank you for not um, But I actually wanted to get back to the visual habituation um, data, which was yeah. very intriguing, too. And I just wondered, um, you know, Thinking about that, again, my perspective, somebody who's coming from AAC, so uh, different, but yeah. I just wonder, do you think that these kids maybe rely a lot more on a visual cue if you're a child with a hearing impairment? And so habituation looks different for you because you're so used to relying on that cue. And I just wonder, did you do an auditory habituation task to see do they rely less? on the auditory cue, or what you think about that? Well, yes and no. Um, with these, I mean, these kids were pre-implant, right. so we didn't do an auditory task because they right. wouldn't be able to hear it. But we have done um, um, a, we have done auditory discrimination tasks, and which include habituation, and so far have surprising, to me, not found differences in habituation rate okay. in, in uh, uh, but th those are, Kids post, well, of course, post post implantation. Right. So I guess it's um, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think that probably what we'll find is that they're processing the visual information uh, differently. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're looking at, um, and we didn't. We now have, in our new lab we have an eye tracker. We didn't have an eye tracker when we collected the data in Indiana that, that I showed. So we can't really see very precisely exactly where they were looking. Uh, we're trying to estimate number of saccades, but it's with the technology we had, I mean just a basic camera, it's not it, it's not very fine grained, but we're kind of taking a stab at it right now. Um, but I I I guess I, I'm guessing that there will be differences in in the scan patterns, uh, reflective of um, you know pulling in more information about the object, and and that being the reason why their habituation rate is is slower. Thank you. Yeah. So are those kids. Um going to get implants? That's, uh, yeah, they were all <coughs> implant candidates, and we just got them in before um, before switch on. A lot of times after surgery, but before switch on. Right. Is there a way you can follow those kids and uh, see how they develop? Um, 
the thing I'm asking is because uh, if you look to that to the visual system, it's probably invade the auditory cortex. Right. And if that's more for the more successful kids in visual task, yeah, they are they turn out to be poor. Yeah. When they got the implants. So we really wanted to do that, um, but um, partly. Um, we just were not, a, there were a bunch of kids we weren't able to get in again, or at least not enough times to uh, do this experiment. This experiment was actually kind of a tag on uh, a, a, a bunch of other projects. So it didn't receive the priority. Like if I knew that there would be like interesting results, I would have made it a higher priority. But uh, it kind of was a little bit lower down the totem pole in terms of like, you know, and you you bring in a kid, you you, they're they're only going to get through so many tests. So there were, and then I left. So um, so there's that too, uh, in terms of in terms of follow up. Um, but uh, yeah, we ended up not being able to collect a whole lot of data from from that. But what I really want to do in Columbus is is run more kids on this and also bring in um, kids or infants from. Um, families where parents are native signers um, so that the differences in like exposure to language um, you know that there are really differences in exposure to language and, and just differences in the, in the auditory domain um, you know there aren't very you know those families are are few and far between um, but uh, I, I'm up somewhat optimistic in Columbus might be a better place to do that than Indianapolis was, um, partly just because of the dynamics that are developing in Columbus. Well, that's all the time we have. Okay. So thank right. you Thanks. very much.